us stand for the scripture reading this morning. Scripture is alive. It's a letter from God to you. And there's something that we'll read this morning that God has specifically for you. Please open our hearts and let's listen for what that might be. Now about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. But the man who loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, through whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone knows this. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. This is God's word. You may be seated. Let's take a moment, let's pray together. Lord God, our Father in heaven, as I begin this sermon, we turn to you, knowing that you are there and knowing that you're here, Lord. Father, I turn this time over to you. Let my words be weak and foolish and clumsy. Let my words, Father, be only a shadow, because yours are the words that are important. Let it be you, Father, that speaks to people's hearts. Let it be you, Father, that touches people's lives. Let it be you, Father, that brings about change. Let everything be about you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've been talking since the beginning of the year about Paul's letter written to the Corinthians. We learned a number of things about it already. We know that the letter was written for a couple of reasons. The first reason was because he heard about many things. Even though he was in another area, he was in Ephesus, hundreds of miles away, he had heard about what was going on in Corinth, in this church that he had set up in Corinth. He'd heard about the divisions that was going on, arguments within the church. He'd heard about sexual immorality that was happening in this church. And he heard about arguments, lawsuits going on between believers, fights and arguments within the church, dividing people. These were problems that he, that he tried to deal with. Always telling people to look beyond these problems. Deal with the problems, but look beyond and see God's wisdom and see God's love. See where God is guiding them. Many things he answered because he had heard about. But then there were questions that this church, this church that was good people who wanted to grow, perhaps too good because they wanted too much to grow. And so they had their own failings. They had pride. They had misunderstandings. But they were trying. And so they wrote him 
and he received a letter and he answered this letter. He asked them a question, he answered a question. We don't know what the question was because we don't have that letter. Something about marriage because he spoke quite a lot about it. We don't know exactly what they could answer, what they are asking, but we could make some sort of guesses and we could look at what he said about that. Today we'll be looking about the second thing that they asked about, food sacrificed to idols. How do we know he asked about it? Very simple, he said so. <laughs> now about food sacrificed to idols. He had changed the subject, to stop talking about marriage, stop talking about being single, stop talking about relations between men and women. And now he brought it back to such a mundane subject, food. But particularly in his situation, food sacrificed to idols. Corinth, all of Greece, were idol worshippers. Particularly Corinth. Corinth was a wealthy city. Wealthy city means you've got money to build. Money to build means you build temples because you want more money. You go to the temple, pray, give us more money. Get more money, build more temples, pray, get more money. It's a good circle. <laughs> That's the sort of thing they believed in. So Corinth, a city like Corinth, would be full of temples. And people wanted money. Or they wanted to marry a certain woman. Or they wanted success in something. And so they used to sacrifice to the idol, saying, please give me this. Please give me a job. Please give me an opportunity. Please make my boss's hair fall out so he looks ugly. I don't know, something. Food sacrifice to idols is very common. How was their practice of doing this? What did they actually do? At that time, the food was used in a number of ways. They used to take maybe a big lump of meat, kill an animal, bring it along. Part of it was given to the priest. He would take his share. That would be his income, that he would have this food. Part of it was burned on the altar, because by burning it, they would think this would go, this would be, uh, that God would go to God. Part of it was maybe eaten in a feast for the idol. You would sit in front of the statue and have a big feast. And part of it was recycled, sold on the market. They said, well, you know, it's still here. <laughs> we sacrificed this sheep. We sacrificed this cow, this bull. We've offered it to the God. He took what he wanted and well, now we can sell it or do whatever we want with what is left of it. I look at this situation in Paul that Paul had to face, these people at Corinth, and I ask myself a question. What did Paul want? Why was he writing this letter? It took time. It took a lot of effort. Some people write, they write me emails. They get very, very short emails back because you know, I'm not a very good writer. But he took a lot of effort to write this letter. It's a long letter. He very carefully considered these questions and wrote it back to them. What did Paul want? Particularly in Corinth, a city famous for corruption. Why didn't he just write them off and say, you're too corrupt? Why should I bother with you? Why don't I go to the nice people, the people who have nice homes? who don't do these evil things that you're doing. What did he see in them that he took this effort to write this letter? He saw in them the same that God sees in you. He saw in them the same that Jesus saw in his disciples people with failings, people with weaknesses, people with hurts, people with pains, people with misunderstanding and confusion. And following the path of Jesus, the same as we mentioned, he took these people and he wanted them to grow. He wanted their lives to be changed not just to have a better car or a better ship or whatever they had at that time, but their lives to be changed in their hearts. 
And that's a process. It's a process that Jesus started when he took his disciples, fishermen, tax collectors, maybe not very good people at all, definitely not very educated. And he took them and he taught them a little bit and let them know. And then with that little bit, he built onto that and he led them, do you really understand it? Do you understand what this means? And then with Jesus' disciples, he sent them out and said, I've taught you, I've shown you, you feel it in your heart. Now go out and share it with other people. Apply it to your own life. You've seen me pray, now you pray. You've seen me preach, now you preach. You've seen me love, now you love. I think that was the path that Paul started. He looked at Corinth. He said, I will start with pagans and turn them into Christians. I will start with the corrupt and I will lead them to be holy. I will start with the cruel. The city of Corinth was a cruel city based on slavery. And I will teach them to love. To know to understand, to apply the same path that Jesus took with his disciples, the same path that God leads you on. To know, to understand, to apply. If you just come to this church on a Sunday morning, you can hear a couple of songs, normally four songs, we pray a little bit. You got a sermon, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and then you go home. What's your life like? How much are you knowing? How much are you understanding? How much are you applying if that's all that you have? Just that little bit. Paul took the church in Corinth seriously because he wanted them to change. And to start, they had to know. Because without, unless you know, you can't start to understand. And unless you understand, you can't start to apply. The word know, or knowledge, or known, appears nine times. They're asked, about this, they're asked this question about idols, and the first thing he talks about is knowing. <laughs> And he keeps bringing this word up again and again. What is known, what we know. Nine times he mentions it. And he asks them, he challenges the question, same as we challenge you, what do you know? What do any of us really know? These people in Corinth, what do they know? These people in Grace Baptist Church, what do you know that you can build your life on? Knowledge is a dangerous thing. The first time it appears in the Bible is Genesis, chapter 2. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees go out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Knowledge can be a very, very dangerous thing. That's why it's so important to lead in the right path, the right knowledge, to pursue knowledge that has value, to pursue knowledge that leads you closer and closer to God. You learn some things that can be useful. I was an engineer. I know the charge on electron is 1.6 by 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. I know that uh, atmospheric pressure, standard temperature and pressure, is 101.3 kilopascals. I remember all these numbers and they have no value at all to me anymore because I'm no longer an engineer. But I still know them, I guess. Knowledge can be neutral, it could be good, or it can lead us the wrong way. We can see where it's good. In Exodus 31, 3, where, the, where we read about building the... Um, 
building the tabernacle. And we read, then the Lord said to Moses, see, I have given Bezalel, Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the spirit of God, with skill and ability in knowledge of all kinds of crafts. God can use your knowledge, the knowledge that you have, the skills that you learn, the abilities that you have. God can take it and he can use it. When we go to India, we take people with knowledge. Doctors, dentists, nurses, teachers. Not everybody. Everybody's got their different areas of knowledge. But we use it. We use that knowledge. That knowledge by itself is not the important thing. It's the hearts of that mission team. The hearts to serve. The heart to use that knowledge to bring people to Christ. Because the truth of that knowledge is this. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. Knowledge should come from God. Knowledge should be what God wants you to learn. There are many things you can learn and those are neutral like engineering knowledge, the numbers that I learned. But what really touches your heart, what really builds you to be the God, be what God wants you to be, is that knowledge that you have from the fear of the Lord, the love of God, the respect of Him, following where He leads. That knowledge is the important knowledge. We look at this letter and we ask, what do we know? What do we know about things? That was the question they asked. Food, sacrifice to idols. What do we know about these things? About idols, about food. 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 8 verse 4 answers this question. So then about eating food, sacrifice to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. We know that idols are nothing. They're lumps of stone or clay, or wood, or any material. You can take them out and burn them, you can smash them with a hammer, they cannot defend themselves. They can't even move unless you carry them around. The Greeks had a lot of gods, a lot of idols. There was a cartoon of their uh, god Dionysus, who was the god of wine. He looks like a very happy fellow, doesn't he? Glass of wine in one hand, big lump of chicken in the other hand. <laughs> he looks so happy. But what's the reality of this idol? The reality is, he looks like this. Stone. You see those grapes in those hands? Those grapes are never going to get to his mouth. He's stone. He can't move. A hundred years later, he's still going to be looking at those grapes and he still can't reach them. <laughs> it's an important question here in Taiwan because this is what you have. This is what you see in so many places. You see that statue? He is never going to get that food. It's always going to be there in front of him. But for you, you need the knowledge. You need to come to terms with this because it's so common in Taiwan, this sort of situation. Idols and food offered of idols. How many times do you see it on the street? How are we to think about it? Because it is common here. The idols are nothing. Just lumps of stone. And the food? The food does not bring us near to God. We are no better, and we are no worse if we do not eat, and no better if we do eat. It doesn't matter. the food, these things, these idols, the many things that we could have, computers, cell phones, these things that seem so important, they're not going to bring you to God. I have my cell phone down in my office. The one phone number I don't have on it is God's. Didn't matter if I get another cell phone or more advanced technology, I still don't have God's telephone number. God's telephone number's in my heart because he hears me and he hears you. 
and he loves you and he will always answer. But this is something in Taiwan that we have to face because it's so common here. What is our attitude? What are we to think about these things, these idols and this food? The food by itself is nothing. But the act, if it affects your heart, can be very serious. The act, if it affects other people, can be very serious. Being part of family worship, offering the, what does he call them, the sticks, burning, burning sticks, burning the paper money, it's nothing. It's smoke, it's ash. But if it confuses you in your heart, if it confuses other people, stay away from it. Avoid it completely. So the best solution in a complex environment like Taiwan is stay away from it. Stay away from these things. What do we know? Idols are nothing. The food given to idols is nothing. Then what is important? What do we know about God? We have to be clear because we live in this country of many gods. Verse 6, yet for us there is but one God. Shijamoni is not a God. Matsu is not a God. Confucius is not a God. And people who worship Chiang Kai-shek, I have never worked that one out. Why are you doing <laughs> He's not a God either. There is but one God. The Father and Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. This is the God that we worship. This is the God that listens. This is the God that loves. This is the God that leads us to grow. This is the God that had called us to him. This is the God that we belong to. This is the God that died for us. God, from whom all things come. God, who created all things. God, for whom we live and through whom we live. Because without God, there is no life. There is only death. This is what we need to know not just as knowledge, but to understand what that means. There is only one God, and he died for us because he loves us. What do we know about ourselves? Now, all food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge. As I said, we all know some things. Maybe you know about nursing, maybe you know about medicine, maybe you know about engineering, maybe you know about God. We all know some things. And you can imagine this church in Corinth saying, well, we know this, therefore, what do we do about this? A little bit of knowledge is very dangerous. Be very, very careful with it when you start to learn that knowledge because we all know some things but then we say, but not everyone knows this. And the reality is, we don't know everything. That's how we can get very confused when we come to the church, when we start to study. When we learn a little bit, particularly if you only come to the sermons and you learn that little bit that we can offer you in that 20 or 30 minutes. You know a little, but there's so much we don't know. This is why we want you to grow. Grow in no knowledge. But there's another point that Paul brought out about ourselves. We all know some things. There are many things we don't know. An important thing to remember. 
Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Love is more important. You must have knowledge. I'm not trying to say love God and don't read the Bible. That would be foolish. Because you must know God. He gave you this, this gift, His Word, that He reveals Himself to you, that He lets you know about Him so that you can know Him as a friend, as a father, as someone who loves you beyond you can ima- what you can imagine. You must have knowledge, but you must understand that knowledge is limited. You could memorize the whole Bible, but without that love, you haven't grown. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know, but the man who loves God is known by God. This is the path we want to lead you on, a path to know, a path to understand, a path to apply this to your life. Because when they ask this question, when they write to Paul, this, when Paul answers these people who he loves and he cares about and he wants to lead in the same path that Jesus led his disciples, He does this out of love. And he reminds them about food and a mundane thing. Food you could buy in the market, so small, so unimportant. Gives us pleasure to eat that food. But Paul writes in Romans 14, 17 and 18, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. The question about idols, the question about food, it was important for the Corinthians, it's important for you now because of the environment you live in. Australia, we don't have so many idols, but maybe we do. That second house, that place, that going on that holiday, that buying that BMW, we have our own idols. More money in the bank, whatever it is. The kingdom of God is not about any of those things. The kingdom of of God is about righteousness. It's about peace. It's about joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is about serving Christ. The kingdom of God is about pleasing God. To know the kingdom of God, God offers you a path, the same path that Jesus led his disciples. The same thing. Nothing's changed in 2,000 years. No, you need to know what's in the Bible. You need to know but then you need to go further and you need to understand. And when you understand, you still need to go further and you need to change your life and apply it. When he says to pray, understand what that means, that God is listening, that he does answer prayer and he does love you. And apply it. Wake up in the morning and pray. Go to bed at night and pray. Face a difficulty and pray. Face a good time and give thanks. Whatever is going on in your life, apply God's word to your life and change. Food offered to idols. You see it all the time in Taipei. So much. Particularly, I think we have the ghost month coming up, isn't it? Mm, very soon. So you see lots and lots of food offered to idols. Look at it. Look at those idols. Look at that food. Because you don't need to be afraid. Because it's nothing. 
look at it, stay away from it if it will confuse you or confuse anybody else. And then remember what is important. To know, to understand, to apply, and to remember what the real sacrifice was. Not to a stone idol, but this. That was the only sacrifice that had any meaning the greatest sacrifice ever given, the one that ended the need for sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus, of God's Son. What happens in view? In this church, we want you to grow. I want you to grow so much. Because it's so easy to get into a Sunday cycle you just come here on a Sunday, you listen to the sermons, you go home. It's so easy. But that's not the path that God wants for you. He wants you to grow because you're special to him. You are so special that he gave your son Jesus to die for you. He wants you to grow. And that means knowing. Knowing, understanding, applying. We're starting these Sunday school classes because we want to try to help you. If you have another path that God is leading you, great. I'm not trying to take you away from BSF or anything like that if that's the path that God has led you. But grow. Look at these things and say, am I growing? Because God wants you to grow. And we want to try and help you. Let's pray for a minute. Lord God, our Father in heaven, we thank you that you have called us to be your sons and your daughters. But let us always remember that sons and daughters, although they are born as babies, are not meant to live as babies. That you intend us to grow, to mature, to produce good fruit. Let us obey, Father, and let us follow. Let us follow where you lead us. Let us understand you. Let us know your word and let us understand it in our hearts. Let us understand that without your word, we are dead. And let us share the word to people who need it so much. Let us apply it in our own lives and change. And let us share to people who desperately need it because they have nothing, because they don't have you. Lead us, Father in the direction you call us. And we thank you, Father, that you do call us to grow. Thank you, Father, for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.